There we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. So um, perhaps just a few words uh, about me to start with. Um, I've been researching my uh, Jewish Tunisian ancestors uh, since uh, 2010. And uh, in Tunisia, local records are uh, difficult to access and very often uh, non-existent. Uh, and so as it turned out, uh, the best records on Tunisian Jews are to be found among um, French uh, consular archives uh, and also other countries' uh, consular archives. And so I um, uh, formed a team of 25 people uh, to uh, start exploiting French consular archives uh, pertaining to Tunisia. Uh, and I've also started exploiting British and Dutch uh, consular archives uh, pertaining to Tunisia again uh, myself. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm going to, uh, to uh, try and do in this uh, presentation is um, uh, get you interested in using those uh, diplomatic archives in your own research uh, to show you the, the most uh, genealogically useful types of records and to give you some ideas of how to exploit them. Uh, you will see a lot of uh, examples um, from Tunisia because this is what I have um, researched in uh, multiple archives. But at the end, we'll try and, and broaden this a little bit uh, beyond Tunisia to, to consider the value for um, a lot of countries uh, which had consular representation uh, from uh, various European uh, powers uh, and how that can be useful in your own research. Um, so the, the presentation is divided into three uh, sections. Uh, first, we're going to uh, lay down a few basic definitions uh, who are uh, ambassadors and consuls and uh, how do they produce archives and where are they stored? Um, in, a, in a second section, we're going to talk about the most useful uh, types of records uh, and what sort of genealogical value you can uh, extract from those records. Uh, and then we're going to go um, uh, to, to look at which archives in which countries and of which European powers uh, have been exploited, have been used, and, uh, and a call to action for you uh, to actually uh, start working on those archives as well um, when they have not been uh, used already. So um, this is the, the house of a French consul in, uh, in Tunisia, uh, in the provincial town of Sousse. Uh, it's a pretty nice house. Um, and. Um, and we're going to, to start talking about the, the records themselves. So what are diplomatic and consular archives? They're records pertaining to the foreign affairs of the country, and they're um, typically um, letters and documents exchanged between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, country representatives, including ambassadors and consuls or their staff, the country's own citizens, and foreign officials or nationals. In general, those records are kept uh, by the country's national archives uh, and possibly uh, in some cases also by a dedicated archive uh, depot uh, run by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and so to give you a few examples, in the, in the UK, uh, the national archives hold uh, diplomatic records in the Netherlands, the National Archives uh, in The Hague uh, holds diplomatic records. In France, uh, we have a dedicated uh, archive depot uh, for uh, diplomatic archives, which is called Archive Diplomatique. And they have actually two sites, one in uh, La Courneuve near Paris and one in Nantes, uh, not very far from Brittany in the western part of France. Uh, and then some of the diplomatic archives are also held by the National Archives. Um, and as we will see, those are very, very big collections. Uh, and so it's not uncommon to find uh, them split across uh, several archival uh, depots. Uh, in Italy, uh, there is the Archivio Storico Diplomatico in uh, Rome, uh, which is the archives of the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But actually, as you may know, Italy is a fairly recent country. Uh, and so before that, um, Italy was um, uh, well, there was no Italy, there were 
uh, a lot of different um, provinces or little states which each had their diplomatic representations uh, and so the uh, diplomatic archives of those uh, precursor states to Italy uh, are very often held in provincial archives at least that's what I believe because I've never actually seen them uh, that's uh, uh, some of you may uh, may know about this and we, we might be able to discuss this after the presentation um, but it's uh, it might be an interesting research topic uh, and then I will show you a bit later there's a good website where you can locate uh, diplomatic archives around the world so in general uh, this is really a vast ocean of records um, because uh, the, the time span they cover is uh, very large uh, very often from the uh, 17th century, at least, if not uh, more ancient. Uh, some diplomatic representations date back from the 12th century. And we have archives, uh, maybe not the 12th, but maybe from the 13th century, uh, as we'll see a little bit later, uh, especially uh, in uh, Italy. Um, and uh, the reason they're old is that uh, treaty obligations uh, are generally long-lasting. Uh, diplomatic treaties uh, are meant to last a long time and survive individuals. Uh, and so conservation of the treaties and conservation of the correspondence um, has always been considered um, as, uh, as a part of the production of the documents. And so this generally makes for uh, very long-lasting documents. Uh, often diplomatic archives are some of the oldest uh, a uh, large body of written records uh, in, in history. So to give you a, an early example, um, we have uh, archives of the notarial acts of the Venetian consulates in Tunis in the 15th century. And uh, there's a good uh, article uh, by Bernard Merck, who is a, a noted historian, uh, and he talks about the Venetian notary in Tunis called Francesco Belletto. So this is a Venetian and he um, lived in Tunis for a, a few years and uh, he, he records contracts. Uh, typically he was focused very much on uh, commercial contracts and he notes the names of the Jewish merchants uh, living in Tunis uh, at the end of the 15th century. Uh, and he mentions um, in the 1470s, Isaac and Maimon Kalipapa, uh, um, who are merchants and they prefer Venetian galleys uh, to, um, to transport their merchandise uh, because Venetian galleys are well defended. They have a reputation for safety um, and they travel not only to Muslim ports in North Africa, but also Muslim ports in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and so their trading house from Tunis is active in Aragon, in Sicily, and of course they trade with Muslim merchants and with Christian merchants, uh, typically with the Venetians in Tunis in 1475, which is why there is a written trace uh, that has survived to this date uh, in Venetian archives of, uh, of their contracts. Uh, so this is a, an early example. This is, I have to say, a, a rather rare uh, example. There are not uh, that many, but typically in Venice, in, uh, in Genoa as well, there are some very old uh, archives uh, in Catalonia uh, as well, I believe. So uh, another important distinction, which is going to help us, is the difference between an ambassador and a consul. Um, an ambassador is a foreign diplomatic representative of a nation who can negotiate uh, political uh, treaties between his country or her country and the country where he or she has been assigned. Um, again, focus on uh, political negotiations between uh, states. The consul, on the other hand, started out as the commercial agent of a nation. And the consul typically focuses on business transactions not political matters in the country where he or she is uh, stationed. Now, this was the way it started. And we've seen uh, Francesco Beretto uh, from Venice on the previous slide. But actually, uh, the consuls also, with time, um, added responsibilities, uh, including the uh, serving the administrative needs of their nationals abroad. Um, so typically, they would hold uh, birth, marriage, death records 
uh, they would handle uh, inheritance uh, for uh, their nationals who died in uh, the foreign country um, and, um, and, and other administrative matters. Um, and an important point, especially if you research North Africa, is that sometimes consuls act as ambassadors. And typically this was the case in Ottoman dependencies, such as uh, the regencies of Tunis, of Algiers, or of Tripoli. Why is this? Because the ambassador in the Ottoman Empire, uh, let's say the ambassador of France, for instance, there was only one in the Ottoman Empire, and this was uh, the guy sitting in uh, Constantinople uh, near the Sultan. Um, you couldn't have an ambassador in Tunis or in Algiers or in Tripoli because nominally these regencies, these provinces of the Ottoman Empire um, were part of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So it would have made the, the Sultan very angry uh, if France had sent an ambassador to uh, Tunis or to Algiers. Um, however, in practice, uh, those uh, countries were actually very much independent uh, from the, the Sultan uh, and had their own foreign policy in particular. Uh, and so it was very important for European powers at the time to send uh, diplomatic representation. They couldn't send an ambassador, so they sent a consul. And the consul actually in those countries had a, a very important political role as well. But at the end of the day, this is an exception. Uh, at the end of the day, the distinction is important because they don't produce quite the same uh, set of records. And actually, for genealogical purposes, consular records are generally the most useful. Why? Because they will have nominative information, they will have uh, filiative information, um, and, uh, and they, you know, they will focus on people as opposed to diplomatic uh, records uh, produced by the ambassador or exchanged between ambassadors or between the ambassador and the ministry, which are very interesting in terms of political history, uh, but in general do not hold much um, genealogical information of value. So again, we're going to focus here on consular uh, archives for genealogical purposes. Um, of course, diplomatic archives are also very interesting. Uh, for, for other uh, purposes, and you might even find nominative information in, um, uh, in diplomatic archives produced by ambassadors, but this is the exception uh, rather than the rule. Uh, in consular archives, you have lots and lots of very interesting genealogical information. So why would Jews interact with foreign diplomats? Uh, there are multiple reasons, and all these reasons are going to give rise to different, um, different records. So the first reason is political negotiations between states, which is traditionally called diplomacy. Um, so typically Jews were sometimes sent as diplomatic envoys to foreign countries. This is uh, relatively rare, and you're quite unlikely to have an ancestor who was sent as an ambassador to a foreign country, uh, but of course this might happen. And in fact, uh, so we're not going to cover this today, but I have to mention uh, for Tom's sake, the case of uh, Yuda Cohen, who was sent by the Netherlands to Tunisia in 1712 to negotiate a peace and commerce treaty. And as it turns out, some Tunisian Cohens at the end of the 19th century, so, um, 200 years later, uh, are actually Dutch protected subjects, and they claim that they descend from this uh, early ambassador of the Netherlands, uh, Yuda Cohen. And of course, this is a way to, um, uh, to justify uh, the, uh, the request for Dutch protection in this case. So we should take this with a grain of salt. But it's interesting as a, as a special case uh, that uh, maybe there are some Cohens in Tunisia who are descendants of the Dutch Yuda Cohen. Mm -hmm. So we're going to set that aside for, uh, for today. The second reason why Jews would interact with foreign diplomats is commerce. And uh, Jewish merchants, like Muslim merchants, like Christian merchants, use consuls to notarize their business agreements 
uh, between themselves uh, with local or foreign merchants, with ship captains, with redeemed slaves and, and all of their business transactions, uh, they liked the, the legal security, the contractual security that came with uh, a notarial act uh, at uh, a foreign consul. Um, so this, is, uh, this has given rise to very interesting records, which we're going to talk about in, uh, in a minute. Third reason is uh, administri administration uh, as nationals of uh, the consul's country. Uh, and so, for instance, if you happen to be French uh, in Morocco or in Tunisia, um, you can go to the French consul in Morocco and in Tunisia and uh, let the consul know that you've just had a, a happy event in the family and uh, you have a, a son or a daughter who uh, was just born. And the consul is going to record that uh, in, in the birth record. Uh, and of course, there are multiple other reasons. Now, this is um, for, uh, for us, it's not necessarily the majority case uh, because you would have to uh, be a subject or national of a European country um, for, uh, for this to produce uh, useful records. Uh, it's not unusual, of course, uh, but it's not necessarily the majority of cases. Uh, and then there's a fourth reason, which is justice. Um, and so when there were uh, legal conflicts uh, between merchants, for instance, um, involving either two nationals, uh, two foreign nationals uh, of a given council or a foreign national uh, or a local subject under the consul's protection and uh, a local citizen, uh, the, the, the court uh, who would have jurisdiction would be the consular court. And again, consuls have kept very good records of consular courts, and these are very valuable records in some cases. And so all of these uh, different types of interaction, uh, interactions are going to uh, generate different uh, records. So how to, now that we've, we've laid the, the uh, the, the ground uh, work here, how do we approach consular archives? Um, the, the first uh, step is to identify the relevant archive center in your country of residence uh, or in a country which you're interested in. Uh, and there's a good uh, website to allow you to do that, the Worldwide Diplomatic Archives Index. Uh, and this will give you the location of diplomatic archives country per country. Then you select a, a country of interest where uh, your country of residence had a consular representation. You ask for a finding aid as in any archive or you use the online search catalog on the archives websites. And this will uh, in general show many, many documents, uh, many call numbers. Uh, so to give you an idea, the French consulate in Tunis um, whose archives are held uh, at the Archive Diplomatic Center in Nantes. Uh, this is almost a thousand different call numbers and 83 linear meters of archives. 83 linear meters is a lot of paper. So we're going to need a way to select some records which will have the highest probability of containing useful information. Now, in some cases, the finding aid itself may contain useful nominative information Again, an example from the French diplomatic archives, uh, and I've selected uh, the Sephardic Jew, Moïse Azuelos, uh, and Alfred Daninos. So two commerce houses uh, on the one hand, and Gabriel Valenzi, who, will, who is a, a well-known um, employee, actually, of the French consulate in Tunis, on the other hand. Uh, and so this is in the finding aid. And so if you're looking for names, sometimes the finding aid itself will have some names um, and will uh, allow you to uh, request very interesting documents. Um, but this is, again, a, a very small portion of all the, all the names, all the genealogical information that is held in those archives. And so the question is, how do we navigate in this ocean of documents and avoid getting lost? So this is um, the, the second section now in this presentation. Um, you can see the Dutch consulate in Tunis. Uh, probably in the, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, and this comes from the Dutch uh, diplomatic archives. For those of you who know Tunisia uh, and the Tunis area, especially, I believe this is the Bukornin, uh, 
which is a local mountain in the background, and you can see the, the Dutch flag floating on the consulate. So, which types of records are most useful? Uh, so, going from um, less useful to most useful, correspondence, typically with private persons. This is going to have uh, potentially really interesting letters uh, between the consul or his staff or consular agencies uh, outside of the capital city with private persons, and this may include persons of interest. Um, so, and typically, this is not necessarily genealogical information, but in some cases it may. Uh, in some cases, you, you read letters and they talk about the writer's uh, families or relatives, and this can yield very uh, valuable information. Then you have consular courts, uh, consular court records. Um, this is basically the uh, transcripts or the list of um, uh, lawsuits uh, in consular courts. This can yield valuable information, passports. This will yield interesting information as well, including in some cases, in fact, quite often, uh, genealogical information because people travel with their children um, or with their parents or as a family. And so this is a little genealogical unit here. We have notarial acts. Um, this is also very interesting. Consular BMD records, not many, but of course, when you have one that applies to your uh, research, that can be very useful. And then protected subjects is probably uh, the, the most valuable and the richest um, type of record in terms of genealogical information. We're going to look at those six types of records, look at examples, um, so you know where to look when you go to one of these archives. So correspondence with private persons, these are typically letters exchanged between the consul, his staff with various individuals. The number of potential topics is uh, very large, obviously. The, this can be about uh, commercial issues, this can be about uh, property issues, uh, this can be somebody complaining that uh, a national of the consul has wronged uh, the, 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 the local citizen. It can be a, a number of things. Now, typically, uh, this is, these are documents that arrive uh, at the consulate uh, on very diverse um, uh, media. Uh, so you have letters of all sizes and shapes. It's typically unbound. And so you get these big folders full of, uh, you know, loose paper, basically. Uh, it's potentially covering multiple centuries, and uh, so the script is not always easy to uh, decipher. Uh, it's also written in multiple languages. Uh, so in North Africa, typically uh, Italian, French, uh, but you also get some uh, uh, letters in Arabic, uh, in Hebrew in some cases. Um, typically, there isn't a lot of indexing done uh, in the finding aids. Uh, sometimes there is, but uh, if there is not, um, what I recommend, and we're going to talk about this in the third section a little bit more, is basically to approach this systematically and um, uh, index everyone in the folders. It can be long, but it can be a lot of effort, but it can be very rewarding, uh, and then focus on a topic that is of interest to you in the period that is of interest to you. But even in a given year, you, you might have some consulates uh, which have you know, hundreds of letters. Uh, so it's a lot of work to go through letters, read the script, decipher the script, uh, and understand the gist of what is being said. Now, let's see an example of that. Um, this is a letter that you will find at the uh, UK National Archives. Uh, this is a, a certificate established in uh, Livorno, in Leghorn, on March 7th, uh, 1796, by the, the public notary, uh, and it's authenticated by Salomon Cohen Bakri, Isaac Arbib, and two other signatures in Hebraic, uh, in Hebrew, uh, who are merchants of the place of Leghorn. Uh, and so you have uh, two signatures and uh, plus two uh, plus two other uh, uh, signatures that are not uh, that do not appear because this is a copy of the document. Uh, so this is a, this is an example um, of uh, of correspondence. Let's move on to to the next one, uh, consular courts. So typically these are courts presided by the consul himself, by the chancellor of the consulate, or by uh, what is called the dogma in French, the translator. 
uh, and they judge conflicts involving the consuls nationals and or protected subjects and or possibly local subjects. Um, now, the, these can be lists of uh, lawsuits with dates, um, with, uh, and you might find the name, uh, be, but these might be also transcripts of what has happened in the lawsuit or what the complaint is uh, and, and how, this, uh, the, how the judge decided to, um, uh, to judge. And so it can yield very uh, vivid biographical information for many individuals, for their business, uh, or for their everyday life. Uh, not always conserved, very rarely indexed. I I've almost never seen indexes uh, of these, uh, these sort of records, uh, but they can be very useful. Let me give you an example. This is the, um, the Justice of the Peace at the French Consulate in Tunis. Uh, so this is a, a subordinate court to the consular court. Uh, and uh, on 17th December, 1873, uh, there's a, a Tunisian shoemaker um, who is not named, uh, who is complaining against uh, a Tunisian Jew called Salum Zaytoun. Uh, he's complaining that Salum Zaytoun gave him a cigarette loaded with gunpowder. Um, and so the, the, there's a record of that, uh, and um, uh, there's a record as well of what the judge uh, decided, uh, I think there was a fine for uh, Salam Jetun. There is a whole lot of, uh, of records such as these in the French um, diplomatic archives, in, uh, in the um, British diplomatic archives as well, uh, of the British consulate in Tunis. Uh, it's actually quite, uh, quite uh, lively. Uh, I think it's, very, it's a very vivid uh, representation of people's lives. Passports. Um, so the consul can deliver passports. Uh, the consul also stamps passports, um, delivers passports to his nationals or protected subjects when they travel abroad, or he stamps the passports of uh, foreign nationals traveling on ships under that consul's uh, nation flag. And so you see an example here uh, from the, uh, the Dutch uh, National Archives, uh, the Dutch consulate in Tunis on uh, June 17th, 1850, um, the consul has seen passports for three brothers, uh, Jacob, Isaac, and uh, Joseph Enriquez, uh, who are natives and residents uh, of Tunis. They're traveling to uh, Beaune in Algeria, uh, and they're the sons of uh, the late Sema Enriquez, who is a Dutch, uh, sorry, and uh, they are Dutch, no, he was, he was a Dutch protected subject. This is all in the passport uh, register of the Dutch consulate in Tunis. Now, of course, not all of the entries in the um, passport register uh, are this rich uh, from a genealogical uh, point of view, uh, but sometimes you find things like this, which can be really, really useful. Uh, so again, um, can be uh, quite useful. Uh, the, the registers are not kept uh, uh, are, are very rarely kept before the 19th century as well. So notarial acts, uh, there's an example up there, uh, which I will translate, um, which was uh, transcribed by Pierre Grandchamp. Uh, Pierre Grandchamp was the, uh, uh, the archivist of the French consulate in Tunis, and he spent his later years in Tunis uh, transcribing uh, notarial acts uh, from the archives of the French consulate in Tunis, and he has published a, a series of books. Uh, and the little extract you see at the top, uh, at the top right, uh, is actually a transcription or a, a, um, a summary of a notarial act in Italian uh, on uh, May 1st, uh, 1607. And we have uh, Simone Ruggieri from uh, Marseille in, in the south of France. Uh, he has received 149 um, coins of eight uh, Spanish uh, uh, royal coins um, from Isaki de la Reina. So this is a really Sephardic Jew from Constantinople. Uh, and that sum, this is a loan, and the sum will be um, given back in Gerba. This is typically a notarial act um, that has been recorded by the consul because the 
the two uh, persons involved wanted to record uh, their commercial transaction. So here the consul acts as a notary uh, to witness and to record commercial contracts. Uh, and there are various types of commercial contracts. We've just seen a loan, but typically uh, this can uh, be a joint investment uh, in merchandise to be bought and sold in different places uh, between two merchants. This can be the contracting of a ship and his captain to carry merchandise and possibly the merchants as well between various ports. This is called a, a nulli in French. Um, this can be a former slave recognizing the debt he owes to the merchant who bought his freedom back. This can be a claim for unpaid debt or bill of exchange uh, against another merchant. This is called a prote, uh, from the verb to protest. Um, it can be an insurance claim after a shipwreck. It can be a mandate from one merchant to another, uh, possibly a close relative, in which case usually it has genealogical uh, value. Uh, so a mandate to, to act as a, as a proxy in affairs uh, abroad uh, can be a number of, uh, of different uh, types of commercial transactions. Uh, and then there are also civil agreements, um, largely focusing on inheritance, uh, typically an inventory uh, of somebody's assets uh, after his death um, and, and the succession that, uh, that ensues. These are, uh, first of all, typically quite old. Uh, we'll see uh, a little bit later than that uh, for the French consulate, for instance, we started uh, in the 16th century. Uh, we've seen Francesco Beretto as well, which was a, an earlier example in the 15th century. So these are uh, quite, uh, these are kept for long periods of time. Uh, they're continuous series very often, uh, and they can be quite old. They're also quite large um, registers, they're bound. Uh, not always easy to read. Uh, it's quite surprising to see that the languages uh, in which those documents are written are not always the, the language of uh, the consul's nation. Uh, and so typically in the Dutch consulate, you will find uh, uh, notarial acts in Italian, in French, um, and in other languages. Um, there are very few indexes, uh, typically. So Pierre Grandchamp is, uh, is an exception, although uh, I don't think he actually has an index. Uh, he has a transcription, not an index. And typically those records include many uh, Sephardic merchants from Livorno uh, in Tunis. This is, these are typically uh, um, uh, Grana, from uh, Livornese uh, merchants from uh, Tunis or Livornese merchants from Livorno uh, from the 17th uh, century onwards. Um, a lot of the acts um, do not mention a person's parents or a person's children, but there are some acts that mention uh, somebody's father. Um, and there are some acts which are really interesting, which are the proxies. Uh, and in, in, in many cases, this is a proxy between family members and you learn about the relationship between the two family members uh, or more that are mentioned. And, um, and so this is of course very useful. Uh, but even when the acts are not filiative, the signatures can be very useful. You get some uh, signatures in Hebrew uh, that have the name of the father, uh, even if the, the act itself does not have the name of the father. Uh, so, and of course, signatures also allow you to make sure that two individuals in different uh, records are actually the same person. We're going to see an example a bit later. So very interesting uh, act. So Pierre Grandchamp started this uh, for the French consulate in, uh, in Tunis. Uh, and, uh, and Gilles Boulou and Liliane Nejar uh, from the Cercle Généalogie Juive uh, are, are specialists of these uh, types of records uh, for the, the French consulate in Tunis. Um, so uh, very useful uh, type of record. So an example here from the, the Dutch consulate in Tunis. This is a, a certificate. Uh, by multiple merchants for uh, Sharon Bessis, who is a, a Tunisian Jew from the, the, the indigenous community, from the Twansa community. And so the, the, the four merchants here um, attest that uh, the merchandise that Sharon Bessis received from Livorno is of a smaller size than uh, would have been expected. And so they sign Manuel de Isaac Bocara, Abraham de Yehoshua de Paz, Abraham de David Tapia y Campona, and Manuel de Gabriel Valenzi. Uh, so you see the signatures, very beautiful signatures uh, with father's names. Uh, and so this helps uh, tracing these uh, families of merchants uh, over several generations in some cases. 
BMD Records, uh, that's uh, uh, obviously the, the most popular uh, raw material for genealogy. And the consul keeps BMD Records for his nationals. Um, so of course, there are not many typically BMD consular BMD Records uh, because in general, the, the foreign minority is a small minority in a given country. But when you find some uh, that are relevant to your research, then can, they can be very useful. Um, and so this is uh, the death record of Jose Vatias, uh, who is Algerian. So he was probably born in Algeria. Uh, and he died uh, in April 1846 in, uh, in a hospital uh, in Tunis, um, the hospital of the Sisters of Saint Joseph de l'Apparition. So typical uh, consular death record. Um, and finally, protected subjects. And this is arguably the richest source of genealogical information on a large scale uh, for, a, a given, um, for a given consulate in a given country. So to, to understand what uh, consular protection is, we have to go back to uh, medieval commerce treaties, which already included some provisions to protect the merchants who did uh, business transactions in foreign countries. Uh, and this was actually formalized uh, in uh, what are called uh, capitulation treaties between France and the Ottoman Sultan. Uh, and, and the idea was to allow Ottoman subjects, um, well, first of all, to, to allow French merchants to escape uh, the local courts and to escape local taxation. And then this was extended to Ottoman subjects serving French merchants and serving foreign merchants as well. It's more a bit more general than France. Um, so those Ottoman subjects, which acted as courtiers or translators or agents for foreign merchants, uh, could claim consular protection, and they escaped the taxation, and very importantly, they escaped the courts of the local Ottoman ruler. This is what consular protection is. Now, before the 19th century, this was uh, used for a very small number of local subjects working for the consul, working for foreign merchants. Um, starting in the early 19th century, uh, it's going to be used by uh, European powers on a large scale to increase local influence. Uh, and so typically France has done that a lot, but uh, you find um, more than a thousand, probably 1,500 protected subjects, for instance, uh, in the Dutch consulate in Tunis. Um, and so many European powers um, granted consular protection to local subjects to increase their, their influence. And so especially in the case of France, Algeria becomes French in 1830. And so uh, Algerian natives traveling to Tunis uh, would claim French consular protection. And because uh, at the time um, there was no um, uh, birth records or the, there were no birth records, there were very few documents. Uh, and of course the borders between these countries were actually very porous. So Tunisian subjects realized that consular protection was actually very useful, right? You, you could avoid paying certain taxes. That's a great motivation. And the second motivation is if you're a Tunisian subject and you are judged uh, against a Muslim uh, Tunisian subject in a Sharia court, you're probably not going to be judged very impartially. And so the consular protection allowed uh, Jews to escape the local courts and to be judged by a European court, basically. So Tunisian subjects saw that Algerian uh, natives could claim consular protection in Tunisia. So what did they do? They traveled to Algeria for a weekend. They had the local uh, French administration uh, issue a little paper saying that um, uh, Jacob was actually from Algeria, from Oran, or from Algiers, or from Tamsen, and then traveled back to Tunisia and went to the French consul in Tunisia and showed the paper and said, look, I'm Algerian, or my parents are Algerian, and so please grant me consular protection. So this happened a lot, and, uh, and there are a lot of protected subjects. And the great thing is uh, the consul would maintain registers of their protected subjects. And consular protection is not only for uh, the, the person, it's also for his whole household. And so the consuls registered, recorded, uh, not only the person's name and identity as best they could, 
but also uh, his spouse and his children, and very often also other family relationships uh, between protected subjects. So this is really useful genealogical information, and we're going to see an example right now of this gentleman called Shalom Alouche, who is a Tunisian subject under French Council of Protection. And the, what you see here is a picture of uh, the, the, what is called the matricule, the, the Council of Protection Register of the French Consulate. So first of all, you see his name and the name of his father. He's Shalom Ben Mouchi. So his father was called uh, uh, Moshe or uh, Moïse. And, uh, and then at the bottom left, what you see is his spouse, uh, who is uh, Sultana uh, Bent uh, Hawia Smadja. So this is essentially Esther uh, Bat Isaac Smadja uh, with Tunisian first names. And you see his children, uh, Mushi, six-year-olds, Hai, five-year-olds, Lalu, which is uh, Elia, uh, born uh, around 1888, uh, Youssef, born around 1896, and Rebecca, born around 1898. Now, if you move right, you have a, a little script here that says that another protected subject is probably his uncle. So that's what the, the chancellor of the consulate thought at start, because the guy is called Youssef Ben David Alouche, so, or he's called uh, Youssef Alouche, sorry. And as it turns out, uh, it's not the same uh, family. And so it's not his uncle, it's someone else. Um, so if you move up again, you see his place of birth. He was born in uh, Beja, in Tunisia. And, and what it says below is d'origine algérienne, which means that the Shalou Malouche in question told the French consul, rightly or wrongly, that he came from Algeria. And that's why he deserved French consul protection. Then you have a little physical description. He's uh, age 26. Uh, he uh, He's uh, one meter, 70 centimeters tall. His uh, hair is brown. Uh, his, uh, um, his uh, how do you call that uh, in English? Sorry. Uh, anyway, you have this little description of his face. He has uh, brown eyebrows, brown eyes, um, middle sized nose, mouth, and beard. Uh, uh, he has a brown beard. Um, what else? He has a, a, a novel face and he's uh, slightly uh, tanned. And he also has um, something on the eye. He's, um, he has a sickness of the eye, of the right eye. This is where the sort of information that you can find. And then, of course, we have his profession. He's a colporteur, which means a, a peddler, essentially. So this is the sort of information you, you, you find in a single uh, consular protection register entry. And there is, in fact, a lot more, because Shalou Malouche uh, had to give a document to the French consul to uh, justify his uh, uh, Algerian origin. And so uh, there are other documents in, in other sets of records in, uh, in consular archives, which keep these documents. Uh, and these are also very interesting. Um, they also appear, so you, you have all these names appearing in lists of uh, protected subjects. Uh, and typically, again, the, the, the great thing is that you get all the information about uh, the person's family. So great uh, source for uh, genealogy. Uh, and, uh, and actually, this is where I do a little advertisement. Lilian Nejar and myself uh, wrote a book about Jewish protected subjects um, uh, of the French consulate in Tunis, uh, covering essentially the, the 19th century. Um, so we have photographed, uh, transcribed, and indexed uh, about 3,000 entries. Uh, and this corresponds to probably about 10,000 to 12,000 protected subjects. So if you're interested in the genealogy of Tunisian Jews, this is uh, basically the second major source of genealogical information for Tunisian Jews. Uh, you'll have uh, all the genealogical information that we can find in the register itself. And then you have indexes uh, to the supplementary papers. And so if you go to the diplomatic uh, archives in Nantes, this will help you find uh, additional documents on, uh, on your ancestors. Uh, you can uh, order that from the Cercle de Généalogie Juive um, website. Um, and, uh, and, uh, so we have seen the different types of records. The question is, if I find the name of an ancestor, in a given uh, foreign consulate records, 
does this mean that this person was linked to the country in question, to the foreign country in question? And the answer to that is no, absolutely not. So the, the fact that, for instance, um, your ancestor was a Dutch protected subject means absolutely nothing about his link to the Netherlands, unfortunately. Uh, and what we see is that uh, Jews in uh, all these countries used different foreign consulates for different purposes. So to give you an example, uh, I've been working on the, the first death of a Tunisian Jew in London. Um, and, uh, and this is actually Osama, he's bearing the same name as, uh, as I do. Uh, and he died probably in London in 1808. So you see some inheritance tax records in the Prerogative Court of Canterbury, and this is found at the UK National Archives. Uh, and then his widow is um, granted administration of the inheritance. And she enters into what is called a, an administration bond, and she swears that she's going to administer the succession faithfully uh, in front of a British consul in Tunis. So you find some documents uh, in the uh, records of a British consulate in Tunis. Now, in 1880, uh, in 1818, their son uh, commits to pay a debt once he has received the inheritance of his father in London. That's again at the British consulate in Tunis. But then in 1830 and in 1831, again, the widow gives procuration to her son and other people to resolve the inheritance and they do that at the Dutch consulate in Tunis. Why did she go to the Dutch consulate? I have no idea. But clearly, and, and they, they didn't have, as far as I know, uh, any sort of link uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, she just went to the Dutch consulate and uh, there's an act uh, in Italian at the Dutch consulate. And then in 1868, their son, who is by now quite old, uh, basically goes bankrupt and signs a debt relief agreement at the French consulate in Tunis. And the, the two images you can see at the bottom are the son's signature, 50 years apart, in two different consulates on the left uh, in, uh, at the uh, British consulate in Tunis, uh, when he's uh, probably uh, uh, 20 years old, uh, and then 50 years later at the French consulate in, uh, in Tunis. So uh, it's a, you know, the same signature. 50 years apart, and they've used three different consulates that we know of. These are the ones I know of. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's uh, very possible that they might have used different consulates uh, that we don't know of. So again, no, no real relationship in general between the consulate that you find your ancestor in and, and his link to that specific country. There might be a link, but very often there is no link whatsoever. It's just that they could use the, the services of a foreign consul uh, just walk in the consulates and ask for uh, a certain uh, act to be recorded. So we're going to, to broaden this a bit, and I'm going to try and give you uh, an idea of what uh, diplomatic archives have been exploited for genealogical purposes uh, beyond uh, France in Tunisia, uh, beyond the consulates that we've uh, looked at, uh, and we're going to start with uh, the archives of European consulates in Tunis, the ones I know, um, France, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. And uh, first of all, when did the consulate open? France was uh, the first consulate to open in Tunis uh, in the modern era. There were other consulates well before. There was, for instance, a Catalan consul uh, in uh, Tunis, uh, in the 13th century, uh, but in the modern era, uh, France is the first consulate, and this follows very closely the Ottoman conquest um, of Tunisia, because France was uh, good friends with uh, the Sultan, uh, the Ottoman Sultan. So France opened the consulate in 1577, the Netherlands in uh, 1617, and the United Kingdom in 1623. Uh, and the, the types of records that we've mentioned um, starts obviously after uh, the consulate has been opened. So France has notarial acts almost immediately after opening, starting in 1582. Um, so this go back, goes back uh, quite, uh, quite a long time. Um, Dutch consulate notarial acts cover 1759 to 1867. 
And then the UK uh, consulate has acts uh, recorded between 1675 and 1937. Correspondence, um, well, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch win here. Um, the Dutch consulate has the, the oldest uh, general correspondence record, 1736. Uh, France, uh, slightly later, 1761, and the UK in 1770. Uh, consular courts, uh, we have some in the UK starting in 1845. We have no consular court records uh, in the Dutch consulate, and we have consular court records for a fairly short time span in France, 1868 to 1883. Uh, 1883 is basically two years after the start of the French protectorate in Tunisia, and so the consular courts were basically abolished uh, because of the French protectorate. Uh, protected subjects, this is uh, largely in the uh, 19th century. Uh, so starts in 1830 with the Algerian conquest uh, in the French consulate in Tunis. Uh, in the Netherlands, 1895, uh, it started before, but we have documents starting from uh, 1895. Uh, and the, you know, the UK also has records, but it's much more um, fragmentary, uh, and there were many fewer uh, protected subjects uh, of the UK consul in, uh, in Tunis. And then passports, um, 1804, 1804 for France, uh, the Netherlands, 1837, and no passports that I found in the UK. Now, the, the, uh, the, uh, the acts uh, of the French consulate, putting aside notarial acts, uh, which, uh, which have been photographed uh, by part of a team, I mentioned Gilles Bouillou and Yann Nejar, uh, but they are not published. However, the rest has been published uh, either in the book that I mentioned earlier uh, for protected subjects or in uh, Cercle de généalogie juive uh, databases uh, called Régie and Bécan. Um, and you can access those databases if you're a member of uh, Cercle de généalogie juive. Uh, and so we, we, we've uh, really made those uh, a large proportion of those records available. Um, not the case yet of uh, the Dutch consulates and the UK consulates. Now, more broadly, and I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't fit uh, too many countries on a single slide, but what I've tried to do is to show you the status of research that I know of, and you might be able to actually uh, complete this or uh, uh, fill some, uh, some missing boxes. Um, so looking at the, the consular agencies of France, Italy, Spain, Great Britain, and the Netherlands in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. Um, and, uh, and in each at the intersection of uh, certain uh, European uh, countries, consul in a certain uh, Mediterranean and sovereign med uh, country. Um, I've shown in green where, we, where there is a publication for genealogical purposes. Uh, in yellow, uh, where there has been a partial publication, uh, in blue, where work has been started, and in orange, uh, where it's probably a very interesting archive, uh, but I don't know of any work uh, started uh, for those uh, pairs of countries. Uh, so in green, we, we have largely uh, the French consulate in Tunis. Uh, a lot has been published already, not everything, uh, but a lot. Uh, then we have things that um, I know of. Uh, I have started uh, the, the French consulate in Tripoli. Uh, there's a little bit, not much. Um, it's not published yet, but it could be done easily. I have started the, the British consulate in uh, Tunisia and the Dutch consulate in Tunisia. Um, so we'll publish something uh, at some future points. Uh, I know Ton has started uh, a project on the Dutch consulate in Morocco. Um, this is uh, probably a, a very uh, interesting consulate uh, as well. Uh, and Morocco in general is probably a very interesting country. Uh, if you look at the, the French consulate, the Spanish consulate, and, and the UK consulate, um, I don't know of any work for genealogical purposes being done there. But of course, you, you might have done work there, and I might not know of it. So please, uh, please speak up after uh, we finish the presentation. And um, uh, but you know, there, there, it would be fantastic if we could go do some uh, systematic uh, exploitation of these uh, archives. Algeria, um, there are some uh, some archives of the French consulate. 
uh, Spain and uh, the UK would probably also be very interesting in, uh, in Algeria. Um, Libya, uh, the, the primary country there is Italy, uh, obviously, because it was an Italian colony at uh, some points. If you look at Egypt and Israel, um, Cercle de Généalogie Juive uh, has started work under the, uh, the leadership of uh, Dominique Bessis. Uh, she has led a team that has uh, looked at the French protected subjects in Alexandria. Uh, and so the, this is actually um, several thousand entries, 4,200 or 300 entries. Uh, and these are families again, uh, not individuals. Uh, so this is accessible to uh, members of the Cercle Généalogie Juive as well. Uh, but there, there is a lot more to do, uh, even for protected subjects. There is Cairo, of course, uh, which we have to start on. And then there is a lot more uh, in that uh, archive uh, that can be used. Uh, in Israel, we also have a list of protected subjects of the French consulates. Uh, it's about 600 entries. Um, <clears throat> France, uh, French archives, probably very interesting in Syria, in Lebanon, in Turkey uh, as well. Um, in Tunisia, Spain, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to do there. Um, and then the UK, probably in Israel, is, uh, is uh, uh, very probably quite uh, interesting as well. So um, my, um, my call to action there is that it's a, it, there's a, a really a, a large ocean of documents that are very, very useful for genealogical and historical purposes. Uh, we've seen some types of records that are more likely to yield uh, material that is interesting and relevant. Uh, we've looked at those different types of records. The best way to go about it, in my view, is uh, instead of going to look up your own ancestors, uh, which can be very difficult because the probability to hit upon your ancestors uh, specifically in that ocean of documents is not huge. What I think we should do is group together in teams, form teams and start a project to index systematically uh, the, the most interesting record types. Um, and, and this is what's going to yield uh, the most valuable material so you might not find your ancestors immediately, but you have a guarantee that by indexing everything and doing it as a team, somebody is going to find your ancestors and you're going to find somebody's ancestors. And so that's an occasion to help each other out and to publish something that has value for the, the broader uh, community. And of course, the most important thing is publish. Uh, publish a database, publish a book, publish an Excel spreadsheet or a website. Uh, you know, all of these are good. Uh, get the information out there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff. So I've, uh, I've talked a lot. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening up to this point. And uh, I'm going to, to uh, give the floor back to, uh, to Tom and David. Thank you. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. And I think it's a really important um, resource uh, for us. Can I um, just ask about two countries which haven't been uh, mentioned, um, Greece and Austria-Hungary. I'm especially interested in Italy. Uh, I beg to beg your pardon. I'm especially interested in uh, Egypt, of which um, the Italians, which you've sort of mentioned, and the various uh, preceding states, uh, and, and France were, and Britain were the largest. But there was a substantial number of Jews who had protection from Austria-Hungary and from Greece. Have you looked at those archives? I mean, presumably it's similar principle to, to France and everywhere else. Uh, I haven't looked at uh, those archives uh, personally. They're uh, very certainly uh, fascinating archives as well uh, for the, the reason you mentioned. Um, and, and I'm sure there are even more documents that can be used there. Uh, even, um, you know, the Russian archives uh, would be of interest. Uh, you find some protected subjects uh, from Sweden, from Denmark uh, as well. And so I've just mentioned five countries because there are five big countries and important countries in, you know, in Tunisia, especially, uh, which is what I'm interested in. But actually, uh, there are a lot more European countries which had consulates uh, and which had protected subjects and which notarized uh, um, commercial transactions. Uh, and so absolutely, they're all interesting. Uh, I would go at it with the same principles, uh, as you mentioned, David, 
um, and, and then of course it's it's a matter of uh, you know diving into the material and uh, uh, looking at what's most likely to yield uh, valuable insights. Thank you, uh, B Bernard. You have a question. Yeah, I, I actually have two questions. One to you, Terry, uh, Terry, and a supplementary to Ton. But I wanted to thank you for that. That was absolutely fascinating. And before I get on to the question, um, I wanted to add another function of the consulate. My Sephardic grandparents were married in the British consulate in Antwerp by the consul as officiant with various witnesses, including one consular staff and two who from their names I can see are family members. I wondered how common is that in terms of a consular practice? And my guess is um, it was done because my grandfather, although largely brought up in Amsterdam and Antwerp, was born in London and was a British subject. My grandmother, born in Amsterdam, was not. And I'm guessing he wanted to ensure that she would have British protection and also that their children would be able to claim British citizenship. So that's um, the first bit, the first question. The second question to you is you mentioned the existence of a Catalan consulate um, in Tunisia. And I wondered if you'd looked at it and if you knew what kind of documents are there. And while I'm speaking, can I ask Ton a question which is supplementary to my grandparents being born in Antwerp? Um, I've got their marriage certificate. I've got a copy as well of their, uh, like an official copy as well as the original. But um, I wondered whether they had also had a religious marriage in Antwerp, and if so, where I should look for the Sephardic synagogue or marriage records for Antwerp? Perhaps I'd, I'd let Terry answer his questions first. Mm -hmm. Oh, and thank you for the suggestion about the collaborative. I think it's a great idea. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So the, the, about the marriage in, in the consulate, uh, as you said, uh, you, you have to have a link with the country of, of the consul, uh, and, and this is why you, you get married or, or you go and uh, declare a, a new child uh, to, to the consul. Um, so, uh, so in this case, this was uh, your, your grandfather who, has, who had that link, uh, and, and if this is the case, then uh, yes, the consul acts basically as the uh, the, the civil uh, uh, register officer, essentially, and, and, the, uh, and the, the person who celebrates uh, the, uh, the marriage. Uh, my, my own great-grandfather, who was uh, a pure Tunisian Jew, happened to be born in Malta in 1864, um, and that gave him uh, the quality of uh, an Anglo-Maltese subject. And so when he went back to uh, Tunisia, his parents and himself, went back to Tunisia six months after he was born. Actually, no, even a few months after he was born. And uh, when, when uh, his own daughters, my aunts, um, were uh, born, he went to declare them at the British consulate in, uh, in Sousse, in Tunisia. Uh, and then he became a, a protected subject of uh, Italy at some point. Uh, and then he was naturalized a French citizen in 1926. Uh, goes to show that, um, you know, this was a very fluid situation uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically our ancestors used uh, whatever was convenient uh, to, to maximize their own utility uh, for the reasons you've mentioned as well, uh, that you, you chose your passport, uh, you, you chose the, the nationality of your children, um, you know, it, it was all a, a very fluid situation, uh, especially in the 19th century where identity was a fluid concept. Uh, it's, it's hardened a lot since then uh, in the 20th century, but in the 19th century, you know, you could claim citizenship or you could claim identity from different places. Um, Thank in, you. In terms, of, uh, in terms of a Catalan consulate uh, in, uh, in Tunis, um, I, I haven't uh, specifically looked at those papers. Uh, there might be some in the um, in the uh, uh, Royal Archives of Aragon. 
Um, there is also uh, something which is uh, closely related, um, which uh, the, the name escapes me right now, but there is a, a series of uh, three very large books uh, recording um, the, um, uh, what's called the, the Consolare del, uh, del Mare, I think, the Consulate of the Sea in Barcelona, uh, which is uh, the organization that uh, cared for Catalan merchants uh, doing commerce abroad. Um, and those records have survived. Uh, and so you can see, for instance, there are uh, records of ships departing on a certain date in the Middle Ages to go to uh, you know, Tunis or Alexandria or uh, Cyprus or wherever. Uh, and so some of those documents, typically there's not a lot of uh, nominative information, however, in the Consolate, uh, Consolate del de Mare, uh, but there might be some stuff in the Aragon archives, possibly. I Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry, Bernard. Um, I don't know uh, about Antwerp archives. Um, I imagine there was a Jewish community. I don't know if Sephardim was separate from that. But I will uh, ask around what Thank there you. is. Thank you, I appreciate that. And what's online are... I know uh, that Belgian records are harder to access because they have mm -hmm. different data security laws. Yeah, uh, what they do have online are the Vreemdelingen registers or registers of strangers. Yeah. Uh, for Antwerp. For okay. other cities, they are not online, but that's a great resource. And I left a have lot a of Jews in of Antwerp. My, have a record of my grandfather being allowed um, about seven years earlier to work and register in Antwerp. Mm -hmm. But I also know that his parents were living just outside Antwerp at the time although he wasn't born there. So it's all, as um, Thierry says, it was very fluid. And my family in the 19th century lived in a triangle that was Amsterdam, London, and Antwerp, and they seemed to move every few weeks. <laughs> okay, Thierry, uh, I have a few questions. Uh, one is about the nationality of the consuls. Were they all French in the case of uh, French consuls in all those countries? Uh, yes, typically the, the consul was uh, a national of the country he represented uh, in, in, in almost all cases. This might not be the case for uh, other consular agents. Uh, so typically we, we've seen the case of a drogman, the, the, uh, the interpreter of the consulate, who is usually uh, very often a Jew. Uh, and very often a, a, a local uh, subject. Um, this was not necessarily the case for um, consular agents in, in vice consulates, for instance. So the, the vice consul of France in, uh, in Sfax uh, might be a local subject or, or somebody else or an Italian subject. Uh, yeah. But the consul himself usually was a uh, national. Uh, my second question is about the status of protected subject. Was that inheritable? So uh, this is this is a very good question, Tom. Because uh, so in, in principle, yes. In in many cases, yes. But the rules vary, and there is, uh, and especially in Tunisia, uh, when the French uh, uh, entered in, in Tunisia and established the French protectorate, uh, what they did, there was a big issue. Okay. When France entered Tunisia, the issue was uh, French citizens would go in front of French courts. Local subjects would go in front of uh, the local court, which was the Sharia court. Okay, it's a Muslim uh, Muslim court, and so um, and, and the local courts were not great. Okay, so the, it was not exactly uh, the perfect rule of law, um, which was uh, we, to put it mildly. Um, and so the, and then of course the protected subjects were judged by consular courts. And this was a big issue for France because the local subjects started saying, you know, we're supposed to be under French uh, uh, protectorate, this is the word, but actually the, the protected subjects get better justice than we do. So we would like to be, uh, to go in front of a French court as well. Um, and, uh, and so what the French tried to do 
and also because it was a political issue, you know, all those protected subjects of foreign countries were an issue for the French. They wanted to see only French uh, citizens and French uh, subjects, so and Tunisian subjects uh, under French protection. So what they did is they stopped the inheritance of the protection, and they asked each foreign consulate in Tunis to draw up a list of their protected subjects in uh, 1895 um, uh, or thereabouts. Uh, and then to say, these are your protected subjects. There will not be any more protected subjects from your consulate from now on. Okay, so the, the living ones, that's fine. And then inheritance stops and no more protected subjects. <clears throat> but before that, it could be hereditary. Thank you. And thank you for the mention of uh, Yuda Cohen. I've looked into him and I believe he was a son of Abraham Cohen who lived a generation earlier in Tangiers, Tanger. Um, and he was from Holland. And um, before that, his family came from Brazil and before that from Portugal. So um, those descendants uh, of Judah Cohen may claim Portuguese passports. Mm -hmm. If they are interested, <laughs> they can ask us. Well, if there are some uh, descendants of uh, Judah Cohen around here, uh, we, you can ask uh, Ton. And, uh, and so Portuguese passports and, uh, and Dutch protected subjects for, uh, for people who claim to be descendants, at least. Mm. Yes. Um, there are not a lot of questions in chat. Uh, Lois, Lois was asking um, about Portugal, and actually this is very interesting because in uh, England, or at least people of, of my generation in school, we studied the Don Pacifico affair, who was a uh, Jew who I think was first of all the Portuguese consul in Morocco and later the British consul in Athens. And the mob uh, burnt his house down in 1850 and the British demanded uh, compensation and an apology. The uh, Greeks uh, paid compensation but didn't give an apology and Lord Palmerston sent the fleet and I think they bombarded Athens for um, half an hour. So um, I would guess, I, I, I mean perhaps you can tell us if you know Thierry, is, is, is the uh, Portuguese archives going to be the same situation as elsewhere? Um, so I, I don't know of, uh, in Tunis, which is, you know, the country I've studied, uh, I don't know of a Portuguese consulate, although there probably was one, but it was very discreet. Uh, in particular, I can't recall Portuguese protected subjects on the lists, um, but I may be wrong. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, Portugal will absolutely have consulates, uh, or, you know, in, in the rest of the, of the Mediterranean. Uh, and so absolutely, they, they probably have interesting archives as well. Um, Alain is saying the, uh, the Picciotto uh, family in the Ottoman Empire were consuls to several nations at once. So um, that, that suggests you didn't have to be of that nationality. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, indeed. Um, I think for the, the, the big powers, you know, France, uh, Spain, uh, Great Britain, probably it was better to be a national. Uh, I know the Dutch uh, consul was a national as well, in, in most cases, as far as I recall. Uh, possibly for smaller countries, you might find cases where uh, they were not a national. I, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yes, examples of that are now uh, streaming into chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, we, will what? these countries, so, so, uh, a big button. when these countries um, like in the Maghreb were still independent, would they have had the same situation? So, for example, would a, um, a Moroccan in um, Amsterdam or London have had some sort of, or could somebody in Amsterdam and London have sort of Moroccan protection or nationality, or, or was it just the other way? So I think in, in, in principle, this might very well be possible. possible. Uh, I think the treaties are um, often symmetrical, uh, but in practice, um, 
I, I haven't heard um, of, uh, uh, let's say, a Tunisian consul in, in Paris, for instance, uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century. Uh, if you, I recall specifically that uh, the Bay of Tunis in uh, 1842, I think it was, um, uh, went on what is called an embassy. So he went to France. Uh, and I think I, probably there wasn't a Tunisian ambassador in, in France at the time. Um, so, so I'm, you know, I'm not sure, I, I don't, I'm not a specialist here, but I'm not sure there existed many uh, uh, Maghrebi consuls uh, in, uh, in uh, European countries. Okay. In Egypt, um, there were both consular courts and mixed courts. Were there, were there mixed courts in other countries? I know there, there, is, there was a mixed court for a short period of time in Tunisia. Uh, but it didn't, didn't last very long. Um, I have an instinct, instinctive feeling that the consular archives of Great Britain in Morocco might be very interesting for Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. But we should uh, take a look. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the most interesting areas, probably not for, for those of us interested specifically in, in Iberian Sephardim, is Damascus, because there's very little, I mean, Aleppo, some of the records survive, Damascus is very little, and maybe we could start to, to reconstruct. Yeah, I think um, especially, especially France and the UK uh, in, uh, in uh, Damascus would probably be uh, quite strong, uh, but I'm sure other countries as well. And presumably the same rules can apply for Ashkenazim, um, although I, I guess they were less, less mobile than Safadim. No, they were quite mobile. In, in fact, in the Dutch, uh, in the Dutch consulate archives uh, in Tunis, in the passport register, you see a lot of Ashkenazim. Okay. Uh, people coming from Russia, from Poland, uh, you know, through, through Odessa, through the Black Sea. Um, I, I looked, this is not diplomatic archives, but I, I looked at um, Maltese uh, ship registers uh, and you had ships going to uh, the Black Sea from Malta. Uh, so you had, you know, you, you actually had uh, uh, significant relationships there. Okay. In fact, the, the first Jew mentioned uh, in the archives of the French consulate in Tunis is a guy called Ashkenazi. <laughs> of course, this means he was Sephardic. Okay. Eskenazi is a good Sephardi name, yes. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he's called Eskenazi. Yeah. Um, Jody Jackson is asking for your email. Um, sure, happy to, to share that. I will share that in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, thank you. And um, if anyone is interested in doing research, him or herself, uh, please contact uh, Thierry or contact us. Okay, Ton, Ton, I do beg your pardon. I wasn't looking at my phone. We have a couple of comments in uh, on, on, on Facebook. Yes. Um, Eli Eliza is saying that in New York, they, at Sheriff Israel, they have uh, families originally from all those countries. Uh, Luca um, says his Sephardic ancestors in, Gris, in Crete managed to get consular protection from Sweden in order to have uh, legal and commercial privileges. Um, why, why did Sweden, uh, a country with hardly any Jewish population in the 18th century, start to give out um, protection to Sephardic Jews in the Mediterranean? Mm. And so two reasons. Uh, one reason is, and this is the case typically for smaller countries, um, if you worked for uh, a merchant of that nationality as an employee, as an agent, as a courtier, uh, then you would get consular protection from that country. Uh, and your family would get consular protection from that country as well. Um, so, uh, so this was the, uh, you know, working for a consulate or for a national of a country. This was the, the number one reason. The second reason is that uh, some of those countries encouraged uh, consular protection. Uh, now, in some cases, uh, consuls asked people to pay for consular protection, uh, and I'm not sure everything went into the, you know, the, the, the country's uh, coffers. 
um, and and also it was political influence. Uh, some countries tried to uh, get a little community, a little uh, national community of people who would further our interests. Okay. Um, a question from, 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 from John, which is one of those nightmare questions. He, he says, my, my father had a Turkish passport, which he renewed a number of times in Egypt. Where can I find the uh, passport renewal applications? Um, I mean, doing anything in Turkey is, uh, in, in terms of finding genealogy is a nightmare if you're not a citizen, I think. So. Yeah, you, you'd have to look at uh, where the archives are located between, where the records are located between uh, Egypt and, and Turkey. In both cases, it's likely that they're quite difficult to read. Yes. Uh, and to find first and then to read. Uh, Stephanie's asking, um, where, where, where she can find the uh, book, Jewish Protected Subjects of the French Consulate in Tunis. Um, uh, I've, I've mentioned the link uh, in, the, in the presentation. I, I can certainly, uh, maybe I can go back actually, uh, in the presentation. Uh, it's here, the link is here. So if you go to the, the, um, the website of uh, Cercle de Généalogie Juive, um, you, you can, uh, uh, you will find it there. Thank you. Um, so I have some lots of okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's um, that's everybody on uh, on 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 Facebook. Gosh, gosh, we've we've been at it almost an hour and a half. I'm I'm sorry we uh, took so that's that's absolutely something. fascinating subject, and uh, really it just opens up so many doors. Um, it's wonderful. And, um, I think it's oh. time to wrap up. Would you like to do the honors? Yes. Uh, if you stop. You stop. Ah, yes. Uh, IT. There we go. Uh, I have to find my. I'll do without. Uh, I'll do as out slides. Um, thank you, Thierry, for a most wonderful presentation. And it has given us a lot of uh, things to think about and things to do. Um, I hope you will be back with us in sometime in the future when your projects you are now undertaking take shape. And uh, we don't have a speaker yet for next week. So if somebody wants to uh, contact us, then uh, uh, mail us or go to the Sephardic Genealogy, Genealogy page. Um, as always, you can support us to our Patreon page. And we are very grateful to all our Patreons especially the ones who just signed up, uh, but also uh, all those who supported us in the past. A small gift goes a long way. And uh, hopefully there will be a talk next week. I'm sure there will be, and we'll keep you posted on that. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thierry. Thank you. Thierry, um... <laughs> We'll just message you in, in a couple of minutes. Um, and thank you. Thank you, everybody else. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Ton and David, for uh, having me. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, watching tonight and for the interaction. <laughs>